So what's causing that? What's sort of the underlying pathology or pathophysiology that's leading to all of this cost? Sure. So our, uh, our understanding of what exactly is happening in sickle cell disease has uh, sort of taken off in the last two decades. We've, um, always, we've always known that the polymerization of sickle hemoglobin is sort of the mainstay of what's causing red blood cells to change their shape. But over the last sort of uh, 20 years, we've, we've learned that the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease is particularly complicated and involves more than just the erythrocyte and probably involves the endothelium, white blood cells, platelets, overall inflammation, and thrombophilia. Um, the, the, the basic issue with sickle cell disease is what we refer to as vaso-occlusion. Um, and that's driven by a multitude of factors. What is the hemolysis effect? So sickle, sickle hemoglobin causes, as we discussed, the polymerization of, um, it, it causes the formation of a long strand polymer that, that sort of makes sickle cells rigid. And by default, erythrocytes um, are, are required to be able to change shape as they traverse through the various sized uh, vasculature in our body, and they should be able to make it through um, different types of environments. What happens is as the sickle cells continue to form these polymers, they become unable to get through the, they sort of lose their competency to get through the vasculature. Um, along with that, we have a, um, uh, you know, from the vaso occlusion, we have this effect of uh, perfusion, uh, sorry, ischemia and reperfusion that causes a uh, environment that's unfavorable for the red blood cell. The result of this is that as sickle cells age, um, they, they don't make it to the expected red blood cell lifespan that we know, but their lifespan is probably reduced by about 75% the red blood cells eventually break open and release their content. And the content inside the red blood cells can be quite toxic to the, uh, to the body. Um, they release uh, a variety of molecules that uh, signal to the body that something bad is happening, and the body reacts to that signal. And how does the body react? The way the body reacts to that is by identifying that uh, something has gone wrong in the process of the erythrocyte making it through the body. So what we see is an, an amped up immune system and, and we start seeing consumption of some of the factors that are good for um, the vasculature in general. So we see the consumption of things like nitric oxide, which is responsible for causing vasodilation. Um, and we end up getting a vasculature that's inflamed and constricted. That makes it even more difficult for erythrocytes to make it through. Which sounds like quite the uh, setting for some pretty dramatic complications. Absolutely, absolutely. So what are those sort of comorbidities that are caused by this? So the, the top sort of flagship comorbidity that's associated with sickle cell disease is pain. We see tremendous amounts of unpredictable complex pain that is treated with large doses of opioids, mostly because we don't have anything better at this point to treat pain with. We also see um, a top comorbidity of stroke in these patients. So the comorbidities you see are, are obviously based on where the vasculature is being occluded. It, it's distributed by anatomic site. We see a tremendous amount of lung injury in the form of what we call acute chest syndrome. Um, we, we see things like leg ulcers. Um, and eventually, in, uh, as patients age, we start seeing multi-organ dysfunction. And is that the usual clinical presentation? Every patient, even though, that, even though sickle cell disease is a, is a monogenic disorder, every patient sort of has a very unique phenotype. And, and we see this, um, we see that there's quite a few modifiers in, in phenotype. Um, different patients have different journeys. Um, we see patients that are particularly severe who start presenting early in life, under the age of one, with tremendous amounts of complications. And then we see patients who may have a beneficial modifier in their pathophysiology that 
stops the polymerization of sickle hemoglobin, for example, something like an elevated amount of fetal hemoglobin, and, and, and those patients tend to have a more milder course. So the, the patient journey is very individualized based on uh, the environment that the erythrocytes are going through. And I would just add to that, that presentation at the hospital or the emergency department with pain crisis is the number one reason driver for our medical calls for, for sickle cell patients. And then that creates that stigma that they're frequent flyers, they're drug seeking, and which creates a whole nother stigma around that population. There's a very interesting, sorry, sorry, Maria, do you wanna, you can no, go, no, ahead. Please go ahead. I was gonna say there's a very interesting study called the Pisces study by uh, Dr. Wally Smith where he gave uh, pain diaries to his sickle cell patients. And he showed that what we're seeing sort of as providers is the tip of the iceberg. And really the, the burden of pain in sickle cell disease is what's submerged under the water. So from the patient perspective, it appears that when you follow the pain diaries, about two thirds of their pain is actually happening at home. So we're not even seeing the sort of daily burden that this disease is causing on these patients. We're only seeing a third of it. I mean, this may bring up the opportunity perhaps for um, telehealth or diaries that help clarify what is beneath that surface that may actually lead to the ER visit, right? If we can actually do something about that. What I was gonna comment on uh, was also the chest syndrome, right? Be because as you get admitted, these patients can also be so labile and survival and mortality so, is so high, right? This, this disease is robbing patients of having a normal life expectancy.